every child deserves a safe and loving home. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity and your partnership and our mission. Because of your generosity, we have been able to serve more kids and families having their needs met through our area needs database. And every child or family has a need met. It really is a tangible need and a bridge of hope. And so we are so grateful for that. We've also been able to do more trauma training, um, creative trauma training for
Um, we're actually an alliance of 75 different churches, agencies, nonprofits that believe every child deserves a safe and loving home. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity and your partnership and our mission. And because of your generosity, we have been able to serve more kids and families having their needs met through our area need stages. And every child or family that has a need met, it really is a tangible need and will bridge the hope. And so we are so grateful for that. We've also been able to do more trauma training, um, creating trauma training so that the families can have the support that they need to care for the kids that are right in front of them. So we are just so grateful for your continued generosity. We look forward to what God has in store. Thank you, and we'll thank you again. Hello, my name is Terry Wilcox. I'm the Remember that thing where it's like, or that thing is like, uh, put your own mask on? No, not at church. I gotta put y'all's masks on and then I can wear free in my own. <laughs> Good morning, Mosaic family. It is a wonderful end of our holiday weekend. Would you stand with us as we celebrate the Lord? Sing now. 
as we lift our hands and as we lift our hands up heavens open heavens open let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us and as we lift our hands up
Another one, I am free, and I am free, and I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free, and I am free, and I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free, and I am free. I just 
coming back I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you And I'm sorry, Lord And I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing we've made it And it's all about you It's all about you We praise you in this house, God. You sing worthy with me. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. step into this Christmas season, that's what it's all about, God. That you are worthy of all praise and all glory and all honor. That you would empty yourself to come to this earth to be among us. Sing your worthy. relationship with us and give us right relationship with you. We praise you this morning for that. We get ready to dive into your word, Lord, these true accounts where you spoke, where you taught, and where you performed and demonstrated your power, God, unmistakably before us that you would be God. Anyone who gives themselves a delusion that it is not recorded by multiple men and multiple accounts that Jesus said he is God in the flesh, it is lies and it is deception. Lord, you came to this earth and you dwelled among us, God, and you changed history forever. We worship you this morning. We love you this morning, oh God. And all God's people said, amen, amen. We worship God this morning. We praise a good father. Would you turn to someone around you and say hello and welcome them?
Oh, I'm on. Good morning. Good we morning, did it at the same morning. time. Did you all have a happy Thanksgiving? Oh, it was so good. I guess yeah, was... yeah, we all did. I don't think mine's on. Mine's on, so I guess I'll be doing all the speaking this morning. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, there you go, there you go. Well, good morning, everybody. Patrick, how you doing? It's good seeing. How's your mama? Okay. We've been praying. We've been praying. So if we can have the ushers get ready to receive our tithes and offerings, I want to again thank you, church, for uh, your faithfulness. And uh, just remember during uh, the season, it's, uh, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And so uh, it is part of our worship that we give back to the Lord. And so um, let's pray over our offering that God will give us wisdom, give us discernment to meet the needs in our community, and also for this house. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for the privilege of giving back to you our voices, our, our, our walk with you, but also, Lord, the resources you've blessed us with. And so, Father, we, we bring our tithes and offerings. We ask that you will bless them. We ask, Lord, you'll also give us wisdom and discernment to navigate them uh, to the fullest. And, Lord, we thank you for your blessings in our life. And so, Father, I, I pray that you will stir the hearts of your people to give back to you. And all God's people said... Amen. Amen. Ushers, come forward. Um, if you were not here last week, we, we launched our Kingdom Builders uh, 2024. And so we, I would encourage, if you were not here, that you'd go back and you'd watch next last week's service. And uh, it's important that you watch the presentation, uh, our, how we um, launched out the new vision for it and the money we're going to try to raise. But the reason why and the, and the how behind it. We talked about Nehemiah and how Nehemiah was a kingdom builder and how his heart was really reflected in that. And so I'd encourage you guys to um, go back and watch that. Um, if you have already been there for the service and you have not turned in your commitment card, we're going to be receiving these for the next few weeks. So if you can be praying about what you want to give to Kingdom Builders, remember ministering and reaching people beyond our walls here. And so we're going to ask that you would uh, pray about that and turn that into the uh, back bu bucket back there or turn into one of the staff members. And um, it is truly a blessing to see the impact of our Kingdom Builders. I love Kingdom Builders. There were multiple times. It is a joy to give to Kingdom Builders. I'm telling you, there were multiple times last year where my heart was broken over something, like seeing Sound of Freedom, things like that, where I just went, I'm already doing something about yeah. this because I'm giving to Kingdom Builders. It's great. It's a great opportunity. Okay. Um, Christmas decorating. Um, it's looking amazing in here. It snowed since last week, and um, it's looking all gorgeous and beautiful. Thank you, Elizabeth Piven and her team. We have one more day of Christmas decorating, and that's this Tuesday. Be here anytime between like 3.30 and 7, and we're going to be putting the finishing touches on. And if you, since it's around a meal time, if you want to bring a snack to share, that would be great. Um, so come on out. If you can only come for an hour, come out and help. And then also, uh, so our giving tree, uh, you probably saw our giving tree table when you came in. Um, the gifts need to be back by next Sunday. So if you haven't taken a tag, you still have time to take a tag. And they're, they're mostly, mostly what's left are Walmart gift cards, which we, you can bring us a thousand Walmart gift cards and we will make good use of them. So bring as many Walmart gift cards as you want. But we do have two people still left that have their wish lists on there. We would love for those two people to be taken today so that their wishes um, will be granted. And then the gifts need to be back by next, next Sunday. Did I say something funny? I heard you laughing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, this Christmas, we are starting next week our Christmas series. We'll be doing a four-week series on the simple, uh, a simple Christmas. We're doing something very unique this year. Uh, we're going to be brave. We're going to launch something called The Sounds of Christmas. It's going to be on a Friday night. It's a concert for you guys. And so uh, this is something special. We have a lot of uh, musicians joining with our band and our team. And uh, we want you to sit back, dress up a little bit, and enjoy a, a beautiful evening with dessert, beautiful music, and glorifying Christ. Amen. So uh, if you want to, you can go back and get your tickets now because we're going to believe that we're going to sell this place out. It's free to you. But um, if you go to mosaiccc backslash, no, forward slash connect, I got it. And you can look there under events, and you'll be able to find that you can get your seats. So uh, make sure you go ahead and grab your seats ahead of time. Grab some for your neighbors, and we're going to enjoy a, just a beautiful night of worshiping the Father and his gift to us, his son. 
And so make yeah. sure you get your tickets early because we want to know how many seats we're going to have to put in here. And so grab them as soon as you can. And that's only in two and a half weeks. So um, you're going you're gonna to truly, truly love this event. It's going to be musical. It's also going to be a little bit of a, a little drama maybe. And so you will love it. And some good dessert. And, so, and hot chocolates. So, um, also, uh, we are, Christmas Eve is on a Sunday this year. We normally do a Christmas Eve candlelight service, and that is my favorite service of all year, and uh, we're going to be doing it on a Sunday morning. So, um, we're going to encourage you guys to uh, bring your kids in their pajamas if you want, and we're going to have a beautiful time of celebrating Christmas Eve on Christmas on Christmas Eve morning with the full bang of lighting the candles and you're going to enjoy that. It's my favorite time. I always I always love to get dressed up for that one and um, but this is going to be the first time the staff gets to actually have a Christmas Eve dinner. <laughs> Chris, you get to have a Christmas Eve dinner because we're not going to be here that night. So, so it'll be at 10 o'clock. It will be a, a full, full service. So there will be no uh, child care that Sunday. So but you'll it's be a shorter service, it, right? Just a little bit, yeah. So you'll be able to enjoy that service. So we're starting this next Sunday, A Simple Christmas. And I'm super excited for those of you who always have plans on Christmas Eve night that can't ever join us for the Christmas Eve service. It's really awesome. We look, make the place dark. We light candles. It's great. Um, oh, and another thing, um, Pearl let me know before service, she has a surplus of turkeys. So if you're in need and you need a turkey uh, to pop in your freezer for this um, holiday season for anything, go see Pearl. Pearl, wave your hand. She's right here in the second row. So go see Pearl for that. She's got lots of turkeys. So She's not a turkey. She has lots of turkeys. We can make a lot of Cajun turkey soup. So. <laughs> All right, um, let's stand. No, we don't have the reading of the word today, so we're going to be having it read to us. Um, I want to say a special thanks to my staff. They work extra hard during the holidays. You'll notice they'll put in a lot of extra hours, and so thank you, my staff, for working hard. Um, I got the whole week off last week. I mean, it was wonderful, <laughs> absolutely wonderful. I didn't have to prepare a sermon. I, all I got to do was sit around and eat food, and that's all I did. As eat food. So, uh, but Bob has been putting a message together for the last about, about a month and a half. You've been working on this message, and I know you're very passionate about this word you have to give for us today. So, I ask that you would prepare your hearts for the word. And so, I would like to pray over that. Father, we thank you for the privilege of opening up your word, your divine word, your word that changes people's lives, it changes hearts, it brings hope to the hopeless. And Lord, I pray that our ears will be attentive to what your word has to say to us today. And, Lord, we just thank you for the beautiful day to have a Sabbath rest, to rest in you. And, Lord, for all those who are traveling, we pray you'll give them traveling mercies, uh, bring them home safely, and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Bob, come bring the word. And as he's coming up, I'm just going to remind you, if you're new here with us or you haven't filled out a Connect card, you'll see those in your seat back pockets. Fill out a Connect card and bring it to me at the giving table, because I will take that from you. All right, Pastor Amen. Bob, Amen. Thank you. Good morning. Stacia said she doesn't need a turkey because she's married to one. And that wasn't a bad uh, dad joke, that was reality. No. Here, let's put this right there. Well, welcome to part 15 of our series through Mark, and I just want to open by by returning a, a word of thanks to Pastor Jeff. Uh, it really is a treat to, to watch Pastor Jeff put a message together because he'll call us in. He's got, the guy's got more ideas than, than Dr. Scholl has corns, if, for those of you who are of my age <laughs> or older. And he's, he'll bring us in and what about this and what about that and, and, and so, one of the things that he does better than any preacher I know is he'll have four L's or five P's or, or three S's. The words always or the phrases always start the same so that we can remember them well. And so a couple of weeks ago, as I was putting this together, I had three points, but two of them started with an R, the points number two and three. Point number one didn't. So <laughs> Pastor Joe was, okay, come on in. So we all got to, and we just started working through ours. And so you're going to see that today's message, as I channel my inner pastor Jeff, has three R's to it. 
uh, and it will be easy for us to remember. But to begin with, let's read Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, the words that the Holy Spirit inspired Mark as he wrote this gospel. And could we stand just to honor the divine inspiration behind these words? Again, he, being Jesus, entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he looked at them, and he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill. But they were silent. And he looked at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch for your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And so the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The words of our God. You may be seated. You know, many of us have heard the phrase, Rome was, built in a, Rome was not built in a day. People use that to illustrate the fact that great empires or great endeavors don't happen overnight. They weren't built in a day. They take time and energy and effort. Rome itself began as a small city-state in about 700 B.C., while the Babylonian, while the Assyrians pretty much had the upper hand in that area. And it slowly grew as the Babylonians overthrew the Assyrians and the Medes and the Persians overthrew the Babylonians. Rome slowly grew. And the Greeks then kind of overtook what the, the Medes and the Persians had done. And by about 50 B.C., Rome pretty much ruled the Mediterranean. But it was a republic. It had a senate. It had uh, deliberation. It had, at that time, three men who kind of shared the power, one of whom was Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was kind of the, the, the general up in the northern portion of the Roman Empire. And he had just gotten back in 50 B.C., from conquering a lot of the, the, the Germans and the French and all of that, the Gauls and, 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 and so on and so forth up north. And there was a standing rule in the Roman Republic at that time that no one would come across the borders of the central Roman Republic, which was most of the Italian peninsula, with their armies. In other words, if Julius Caesar wanted to come to Rome, he would have to leave his weapons and his armies. It's like the old westerns. You have to put your, turn your gun in when you come in the town limit. But there was some disagreement among the three who were in charge. And the other two called Julius Caesar to come to Rome in 49 B.C., and the border of the, uh, of, the, of, of the central Roman Republic on the north was a river called the Rubicon River. How many have heard the phrase, crossing the Rubicon? It refers to the point of no return. It refers to, you have now cast the die. That's what Julius Caesar said when he crossed the Rubicon. The die is cast because what he did is he brought his army with him. Now, you have to understand they did so at the risk of their lives. The penalty for bringing your army for a Roman governor or a general for bringing your army across the Rubicon being treasonous was death. And he crossed the Rubicon with his army, he marched to Rome, and he turned the Republic into an empire. Four years later, he was assassinated. A tu Brutus, for those who know their Shakespeare. A year later, the Roman Senate 
which still had been fairly open, and, and, and they loved Julius Caesar because he had done so much to increase Rome's power, they passed a decree claiming that Julius Caesar was divine, that he was a god. And at the same time, or actually about a year later, they passed another decree about his adopted son, Augustus Caesar, that he also not only was divine, but he was the son of God. This is in about 43 B.C. And so coins would be on it with Augustus Caesar, the son of God. When you understand that, you understand the wisdom of Jesus. And in Mark, we read, I think it's 14 times that he calls himself the son of man, but only three times does someone else call him the son of God. At the beginning, Mark says he's the son of God. The demons say he's the son of God. And at the end, the centurion says, surely this was the son of God. But Jesus, who was the son of God, not Augustus Caesar, he had wisdom. He knew that Rome was the big bully on the block. And Jesus knew that he had a ministry from his father. He was there for a reason. And with great wisdom, he also knew that if he went around proclaiming, I am the son of God, which was true, he would have been in the crosshairs of the Roman governor, the Roman army, and he probably would have been killed before he even started his ministry. Jesus knew the times in which he lived. And he exercised great wisdom. He let his ministry proclaim his lordship. And at the appropriate time, he then proclaimed it. But you, you need to appreciate this as we go into this particular story of what Jesus did. Because up until this point, Jesus had not yet crossed the Rubicon. He had been doing, as Pastor Jeff has unpacked, he had been healing, he had been preaching the gospel, he had done a whole lot of stuff, but he had not yet caused a reaction where they were planning his death, which happens in Mark chapter 3 as we just read. Up until this point, he could have just retired and been a very well-respected rabbi who had a lot of really profound things to say. Up until now, he had piqued the interest of Satan and the demons, but he hadn't crossed the Rubicon. Up until now, he hadn't come to the attention very much of Herod or the Romans. But now, the Pharisees and the Herodians, two groups who would never have counseled together with each other, came together for a common enemy so that they might find out how to execute Jesus. So this morning, we're going to find out about Jesus crossing the Rubicon. What is it that he did that finally was the straw that broke the camel's back? How many have watched the movie Gladiator? You know, at the beginning... When he is captured and he becomes a gladiator, he's in northern Africa, kind of a local hero. His fame has not yet grown, but he slowly, bit by bit, as he goes from arena to arena to arena, the fame of the Spaniard begins to grow. And finally, they come to the belly of the beast, and in Rome, you, you, you remember the scene where, where the, the young man comes up and he, and he wonders, you know, are you Hercules? Are you, who are you, Spaniard? And then when he slays the enemies in the ring with his friends, and then you remember when, when Commodus comes and he says, what's your name? Gladiator. He says, take off your mask and tell me your name. And you can feel the tension rising. How many of you were like, come on, come on, come on? And he finally takes the mask off. I'm Maximus. What is it? Darius Meridius. Decimus Meridius. Commander of the armies of the north. General of the Felix Legion. True follower 
of the emperor, loyal follower of the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius. Father of a murdered son. You can see Commodus just husband to a murdered wife and I will have my vengeance in this world or the next. And you can see that. Well, as you read the book of Mark and you go through the first three chapters or the first two chapters, you can feel the tension rising. If you understand what Mark is doing, he's bringing more and more. The first thing, what are you doing? How, you can't heal the paralytic. What are you doing feasting with, with, with sinners and tax collectors? What, eating on the Sabbath? Oh, come on, you can feel the tension rising and you're waiting for that moment when Jesus says, I'm Maximus Decimus Meridius. And this happens in Mark chapter three. I love how Mark opens that gospel. He's talking to Romans who understand that tension. They understand the opposition. And so now we get to the, the story itself. And the first point is this. Jesus remains resolute in his calling. Even though the opposition is there, it does not turn him away from what he came to do. He knew that sooner or later the cross awaited him. He knew that there would be pain and suffering and opposition, and yet he remained resolute in his calling. We read in Luke chapter 9 and verse 51, as the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely sent out for Jerusalem. He fixed his eyes on what the prize was, and he would not be turned away. He knew what the score was when he went in to the synagogue on that Sabbath. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse him. He knew what was coming, and yet he remained and kept his eye on the prize. We read in Hebrews chapter 12, when the writer of Hebrews is talking to us, and he says this, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Did you know that God has marked out a race for you? Did you know that? And the race he's marked out for you is different than the race he's marked out for me. It's different than the race he's marked out for whoever's sitting next to you. God from eternity past marked out a race which is perfectly designed and fit for you. And he designed you to run that race. He did not design you to sit on the sofa with the remote and watch others run their race. Now, you'll learn from others as they run their race, but he has a race for you to run. And his heart is that you become fully engaged in that race. You will not find satisfaction in life until you are fully engaged in the race that God has marked out for you. Fixing our eyes on Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What are you willing to pay? What price are you willing to pay to follow Jesus? Are you willing to lay your life down to follow Jesus? When I was born in 1954, to be an American and to be a Christian were almost synonymous, at least in, in my family and in my eyes. And it seemed to me growing up that American values and Christian values were one and the same. How many of us know that doesn't, that's not the culture in which we live today? There is hostility to the Christian message today. 
When I went to long-term mission school back in 2010, they talked about how in the 1700s and 1800s, missionaries were welcomed. And then they talked about how then they were tolerated. And today, missionaries in many countries are opposed. What price are you willing to pay to follow Jesus? What price was he willing to pay to redeem you? I want to follow his example. The second point that we see in this particular story is that Jesus not only remains resolute in his calling, he reframes the issue. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. What was the issue for the Pharisees? What was the issue they were looking at? Whether he would heal on the Sabbath. Did Jesus say anything about the Sabbath in his answer? Other than... He said, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. Jesus flipped it on its head and reframed the issue at hand. And that is something that God is constantly doing in my own life, reframing the issue at hand. A friend of mine years ago, uh, John Lydell, we were talking about going through adversity and, and all of that. And he said, you know, I have learned through the years that an opportunity to sin is an opportunity to obey God. That totally reframed the issue in my own life and in my own eyes. How many of us are tempted? Jesus was tempted. But temptation, Jesus did not look at temptation as an opportunity to sin. He looked at it as an opportunity to follow his Father, to show this is what I created humanity to do in adversity. This is what godliness looks like in the face of temptation. And so he reframes the issue for all the Pharisees who were sitting there looking for a reason to accuse him. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 13, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they don't see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. There are too many people invested in their view of the issue that they refuse to let Jesus reframe their view of the issue. I don't want to be that person. My desire, my passion is that when I encounter anything during the day that I look at it as an opportunity to obey. Did you know that most divine appointments come disguised as interruptions on your daily routine. Isn't that the truth? Most divine appointments come disguised as interruptions on your daily routine. Are you open to the Holy Spirit interrupting your daily routine? with a divine appointment. I have that all the time as a chaplain. I'll walk in a room with a certain idea of what's going to happen, and then something they'll say something out of the blue, and I have to say, oh, Lord, how do I respond to this? How do I represent you well in this particular situation? Or we'll be down visiting the kids and the grandkids, and uh, my son Philip will say, hey, Dad, let's go out for a coffee, and we'll be sitting, and all of a sudden the, the conversation goes in a direction very, very deep. And I just want to finish the donut and get home. And yet all of a sudden, we're in a very potentially life-altering conversation. Are you willing to let Jesus reframe the issue for you? You know, as Pastor Jeff has gone through the recent weeks, Jesus did that with the paralytic. They were looking about healing, and he said, your sins are forgiven. What? He reframed the issue. He did it with his choice of dinner companions. 
Oh, it was nice to go call Levi, but did you have to go eat with sinners and tax collectors? He reframed the issue. I didn't come to heal the healthy. I came to heal the sick. So he reframed the issue, and he does it again. Nothing is more important in your life or mine than how we view God. Let him reframe every issue in your life. And that leads to the final point, which is Jesus restores that which is withered. It helps to get on the right page. He restores that which is withered. And may I make this observation about this story? The man with the withered hand wasn't the only one in the room with the problem. In fact, it may be that his problem was a whole lot easier to fix than the Pharisee's problem. The man with the withered hand was not the only one in the room with something that had been withered. The Pharisee's view of God had been completely withered. To be withered is to be dried up, to be shriveled, wasted away, to be ripe. How many have pulled that banana out and it's been there a couple of days too long and it's ripe? Or you open the fridge and there was a peach that you forgot that you bought two weeks ago and it's ripe. It was withered away. And here was this man who had been coming and his hand was shriveled. It had died to a degree. It was dead in many respects. But the Pharisees, their view of God was dead. They thought they knew God. They thought they knew what God was like. And yet God was in their midst and was unlike anything they imagined. I love what C.S. Lewis said. I know God is not a figment of my imagination because he's not at all what I imagined he'd be like. He, he does the most outrageous things. He eats with sinners. When revival starts, it doesn't start among the, uh, the high and mighty. Revival almost always starts among the poor and the dispossessed and the outcasts. And God says, that's who I'm looking for. If we are praying for revival and someone comes in the door and they smell ripe, you're probably close to it. Withered. Mark chapter 4, just in the next chapter, the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. And so when Jesus looked at them, it's interesting, this is the strongest language Mark uses in the entire gospel. He looked at them and it says he was angry. He was deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. The strongest language he uses in the entire, the most emotional. I mean, you know, we read it and it's just some words off of paper. We don't understand the depth of his anger, the depth of his grief, the depth of his distress as he looked at them. It was, oh, my heavenly days. So then he looked at the man, and he said, stretch out your hand. Well, let's take a moment and think about those Pharisees. And let's think about the man. They all had something that was withered. What's withered in your life? I look back on my life, and there were times that my intimacy with God was withered. When my joy was withered, when I allowed circumstances to dry up my hope, when I allowed loss to shrivel my walk with the Lord, Jesus is about restoring that which is withered. What has withered in your life? Has something withered 
in the life of someone close to you where you can be a vessel for the Spirit of God to touch them deeply. We live in a culture that is deeply broken. We live in a culture whose view of God has withered. The question is, how do we represent Jesus to bring healing to that which has been withered, to restore that which has become shriveled and dried up. And in one of the great verses in the entire book, Jesus says to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. I wonder what that looked like. You know, because, I mean, think about it. Okay, the Pharisees, is he going to lay hands on him? Is he going to hold the hand? Is he going to hug him? What's he going to do so that we might accuse him? And he says to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretches it out, and the hand is restored, completely restored. Okay, what are they, what are they going to do? What are they going to uh, bring? Your honor, he healed the man. Well, how did he heal him? Well, he said, stretch out your hand. Did he touch him? No. Did he hug him? No. Did he hold the hand? No. The hand just healed. Isn't that an interesting thing? Because he really put the Pharisees in a conundrum. Just don't ask me to spell it. He put them in a, in a, in, in a very tricky position. Stretch out your hand because the scripture says he did so and the hand was restored. The word restore is a beautiful word. You find it 62 times in the New International Version in the scripture. They asked him in Acts chapter 1, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? We read in Acts chapter 3, the second message Peter preached when he said heaven must receive Jesus until the time comes for God to restore everything. Did you know God's going to restore everything? There are things that happen that just I don't understand. They grieve me deeply. We look at some of the stuff that that has taken place in, in the Middle East and we say, God, how could you allow that? Did you know that the day is coming when God's going to right every wrong? That both delights me and it scares the daylights out of me because God's going to judge every act and every thought. God is going to destroy sin forever. That's why I say, God, remove the sin that's in me, please. God, help me. I don't, I don't for a minute think that I am going to be exempt other than I've put on Jesus. I had a dream a long, long time ago. I was in formation. I'm ex-Navy. For those of you in the Army, yes, we were military also. We, we might have had long hair and, and uh, done all sorts of stupid stuff, but we were military also. But anyway, I'm in formation at the Naval Academy, and the Admiral is inspecting the ranks. And I've, 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 I've put my uniform on, and I think it's really good. And so you can see as, as the Admiral is coming down, And uh, so he looks up and down, and there's the guy next to the admiral who's taking notes on the appearance of the person in front of him. So the guy's over on this side. He's looking. He's saying, okay. Gig lines out. Okay, belt buckle's not completely polished. Shoes, they need work. Looking all and down. And the guy's following him, and and I'm over here. And as the admiral's getting closer and closer in my dream, I'm becoming more and more aware of everything that I hadn't done, of everything that was out of order. And as he's getting closer and closer in my dream, I am consumed with fear. And all of a sudden, he does the thing and he turns and faces me. And in my fear, all of a sudden I realize that he's not looking at me, he's looking at Jesus, and it became a spiritual dream. And he looks at Jesus, 
because I'm clothed in that moment with Jesus. He says, you look good. You look good. I'm so grateful to put on Jesus. I am so grateful that Jesus is at work in my life, changing me day by day into the image of, of, of what he created me for. He restores that which is withered. What has withered in your life? So notice how Jesus restored the man's hand. And, 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 and notice this. The prophet Haggai says this, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations. And then he says this, the glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the glory of the former, says the Lord. And in this place, I will give peace. We use that phrase, the glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the glory of the former. When God moves in your life and restores that which is withered, the glory is going to outshine what came before. Did you know that? The glory will outshine. The intimacy will be deeper. The joy will be richer. The, your ability to respond to God will be so much better. Your understanding of the depth of his love will be so much deeper. Your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit to minister to those around you will be so much fuller. The glory of the latter house. I don't care how deeply you have been broken. When God restores, it brings glory to him in a way that nothing else can. So wherever you are, whatever has withered in your life, do not despair. Run to the Father and let Jesus restore that hand. And it's a risk because how did he? He called the man up. Sometimes he, he heals publicly. So all of a sudden now the man is called out. There you are. You're sitting in you know, the, the row, wherever it is, and he says, come on up. It's like gulp. he knows everyone's looking at him and he knows in that culture that they're looking at him that his shriveled hand was because of some sin. Do you understand that? They asked Jesus about the man born blind. Was it his sin or his parents' sin? Because they knew whatever was shriveled is because there was sin. He's very public. Here I am, Jesus. Stretch out your hand. I don't want to expose it to everyone. They're going to they're gonna see me for who I really am. Is that who you really are? No, Jesus is turning you into who you really are. You understand that? That's not who you really are. Jesus is turning you into who you really are. Now, I don't know if it was healed as he stretched it out or if he stretched it out and then it got healed, but I know it got healed. Amen. And he said, stretch it out. Oh, the relief that man had and the opposition that Jesus had. See, he's willing to identify with you. He is willing to identify with people who are broken because that's who he came for. And so my challenge to you, you know, they say time heals all wounds. That's not true. That's not true. Time does not heal all wounds, not by itself. I uh, was out ATVing with, with my sons up in the hills. We went, I went airborne because I hit a washout and I didn't do it right. So I'm in the air. The ATV's in the air, going down a slope. I turn, I land, no broken bones or anything, but I snapped my Achilles just like that, snapped it. Well, time heals all wounds, so I didn't have to go see the doc or anything because time heals all wounds. It took proper diagnosis. It took surgery. It took therapy. It took time 
Time plus surgery plus the touch of the master surgeon is what allows the wound to be healed. And so we're going to close with that. I'm going to ask you, if you are here today and something has snapped, something has withered, something has shriveled, something has died, or if you have a close friend or family member who has experienced that, God wants to touch it. So could we stand together, please? It may be that you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that you have not yet come to him and said, I want to follow you, Jesus. I've tried to heal myself, and I can't. That thing is still shriveled. The only solution is to turn to the one who lived a sinless life, went to the cruel cross to pay the penalty for that sin which has caused you to become withered and shriveled, rose from the dead to give you new life, life that cannot be touched by disease. Now, we're between now and then. We're already, but not yet. But we're on that journey. And so if you are here today and you have not yet put your trust in Jesus, you have not yet decided to follow him. You have not yet asked him to forgive you for doing it on your own. This morning is the time for you to make that decision. If you are here this morning and there's something in your life that is shriveled, what better time? If not now, when? If not here, where? This is the opportune time for you to stand up and stretch forward whatever has been shriveled and let God heal it. And so let's pray together. I'm going to first say a prayer for those who do not yet know Jesus personally. And I'm going to ask you to invite him into your life and make a decision to follow him. And then we'll pray for whatever else might be shriveled. And then I'm going to ask you to come forward after we're done praying, if you have just made a decision to follow Christ, I would love to talk with you. Pastor Jeff would love to talk with you. And so let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and say, Dear Jesus, I've made a mess of it myself, and I want to follow you now. I want to say no to self and yes to Jesus. I ask that you would forgive me for trying to do it on my own. I invite you to live in my heart and, and, and restore that which was shriveled. And Father, I pray that anyone here who's experiencing the death of a relationship, the death of a job, the death of a friend, the death of, of a dream, the death of whatever, God, that that we would come to you and stretch that thing out for you to heal and for you to restore. For I ask it in Jesus' name. And finally, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord always turn his face toward you and grant you peace. To remind you what Pastor Jeff said earlier, the Kingdom Builders Manual, the commitment cards are on the table in the back of the sanctuary. If you have not yet filled one out, please feel free. If you, if you had given last year, we say thank you. But if you could fill one out again for this year for our records, we say thank you again. And may the Lord bless you. Thank you. Bye.